Coming up on DTNS, a 124-year-old movie gets upscaled to 4K. What Microsoft's reorg will mean for you and why you should check what chip is in your IoT gear. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, February 5th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Otis's grandma's house, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And uh, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just having a conversation about uh, how you should refer to people, spokesperson, spokeswoman, spokesman. Uh, also uh, talking about other things of interest to your daily life. It's a good day, <laughs> Internet. Go become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Checkpoint software discovered a vulnerability in Philips Hue light bulbs that would upload a malicious over-the-air update to affect color and brightness of the bulb. If the owner reset and then re-added the bulb to the network, the exploit could then trigger a buffer overflow to take control of the hub. Checkpoint notes that the vulnerability takes advantage of the Zigbee communications protocol and therefore could be replicable in other products that use Zigbee. Philips has issued a patch. Turn on those automatic updates, folks. Sorry, my mic went mute. That was weird. LinkedIn CEO Jeff Weiner announced he's stepping down after 11 years and will become executive chairman in June. His replacement will be Ryan Roslansky, uh, rather, a senior vice president of product at the company and first person that Weiner ever hired. Tomer Cohen, another VP of product, will move into Roslansky's role. A WhatsApp flaw discovered by researcher Gal Wiseman at Perimeter X showed how an attacker could use cross-site scripting attacks to read the files on the Mac OS or Windows versions of the app by using a specially crafted text message and then get contents of the files from the computer. WhatsApp's desktop was implemented using the Electron software framework, which allows developers to create cross-platform applications based on web and browser tech, but relies on developers to deploy secure apps. Google announced that based on research from 45,000 worldwide consumers, ad blocking changes in Chrome set to be applied later this year will include blocking long, non-skippable pre-roll ads or groups of ads longer than 31 seconds appearing before a video that can't be skipped within the first five seconds. Mid-roll ads of any length are included as well. Image and text ads that appear at the top or playing, uh, of the playing video or in the middle one-third of the video player window or cover more than 20% of the video content also included. Chrome enforcement begins on August 5th, 2020, and we'll see the browsers, quote, stop showing all ads on sites in any country that repeatedly show these disruptive ads. Yeah, Chrome. and that, uh, that'll that that'll cascade down to, to everybody's browsing, whether you're using Chrome or not. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, Disney. Uh, their earnings were, were good, but we're not here to talk about parks or even movies. We're here to talk about streaming, Scott. What, what's the scoop there? Well, Disney announced that it's Disney Plus streaming service, you know, where you all got your a Mandalorian and loved it, uh, has reached 26.5 million paid subscribers. Analysts had predicted 20 million or more, so that's up 50% signed up directly and 20% through Verizon. Doesn't really get into maybe other places. I signed up through Apple, for example, so I don't know if it counts that. But anyway, Disney Plus is expanding to Western Europe in March and will launch in India March 29th through streaming service Holstar, Hotstar rather. ESPN Plus subscribers reached 6.6 6 million and Hulu reached 30.7 million another owned Disney product. Uh, Disney also announced its intention to expand Hulu internationally in 2021. Yeah, and the other big news, of course, is that The Mandalorian officially coming back in October. Uh, we're getting the Falcon uh, and uh, Winter Soldier series in August and WandaVision in December. So interesting, too, because Disney Plus has continually been putting out new shows, but they're not the high profile shows like Star Wars or Marvel. So towards the end of this year, we'll start to get a, a bigger rolling uh, release schedule for Disney Plus. But they don't seem to care. They're saying that even after The Mandalorian stopped, they didn't see a ton of people cancel. Yeah, what's nice, I think, is, uh, well, for one thing, there you know where there were a lot of trials that worked out well and people stuck with it and they stuck through the end of something like The Mandalorian. But also, in my case even though there's not something I need to just jump on over there at Disney plus at the moment, the price uh, for admission is so low that I don't feel that motivated to worry about whether it's canceled for the month or not. Like it's worth if, the extra $5 you might pay for nothing to not have to worry about it. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Like if, if yeah. we're around on a Friday night going, well, we've, what have we not seen or what are we in the mood for? And somebody goes, why don't we watch a Disney movie or something? 
it's the perfect opportunity to do it and it's going to cost us less than us any other way trying to get that Disney movie assuming it's not streaming somewhere else so that five bucks a month six bucks a month just isn't that big a deal and I think they were smart to I hope stay there but also launch there at that price because I think a lot of people are just hanging around because that's not that big a deal five bucks well and and you know Disney plus is going to be in that category uh the same with Netflix or HBO or you know that the, that caliber of of network where people are sort of like, oh, there's a show I want to watch. But then that show is, I don't know, on hi hiatus or ends or something. But it's not that expensive. I'm just going to keep it around. And I think Disney Plus, especially with The Mandalorian, um, out of the gate, got so much attention that, yeah, you're not seeing a lot of people, uh, you know, bailing out of the network at this yeah. point. I do, I do cancel HBO between big shows I care about because – that's 15 bucks, right? Like it, it's a right. significantly more uh, a cost advantage to either keep it or get rid of it. So in my case, that one's an easy one to kind of keep track of and restart when I want it and so on. But with Disney, they're giving me something that costs less than, say, CBS All Access. And the only reason I'm getting that is for Star Trek while it's on. And there's no way I'm keeping that around after that because what else are they going to give me? Disney's got just enough over there to say, well, look at this giant backlog and we're adding to it all the time and their documentary stuff is really good. And, you know, sometimes there's a nice surprise over there. And at the very least, all my Marvel, Star Wars and and animation, Disney and Pixar stuff is going to be taken care of there. So I just think they have they ha they they came out strong. We knew they probably would. But what's keeping people there is low price combined with a pretty good back catalog that'll keep them around until their next, you know their next Mandalorian fix. I well, guess. and there's lots of room to grow here. This is less than half of the domestic uh, U.S. subscribers of the U.S. Obviously, Disney Plus rolling out worldwide, so it's, the, the subscriber is going to go up as it reaches new markets. Uh, we, we're far from having seen the peak uh, of Disney Plus at this point, and Hulu reaching 30.7 million is just getting close to half of Netflix's numbers, making it a very solid uh, subscription service that that has always been sort of an also ran of like, oh, Hulu also has stuff and some people like it. Uh, and again, Disney plans to make that international as well. So we'll see those numbers go up in, in addition. Speaking of numbers, Spotify reported 271 million worldwide subscribers, up 31% over a year ago. Paying users rose 29%. Podcast listening grew to two. 200% and 16% of Spotify's monthly active users also listen to podcasts. Revenue rose 24% with a loss per share of 1.14 euros, both of which missed expectations. So there's growth, but not necessarily the growth that some people wanted to see. Spotify blamed the loss on payroll taxes related to stock compensation as its stock price rose. The company announced it will also acquire Bill Simmons sports podcast company Ringer, Ringer also gave us binge mode, so they're just the best people ever. Spotify faces increasing competition in the music streaming market, including India's Ghana, which has 152 million monthly active users. Yeah, uh, I like th I like that we throw those those things in there because a lot of people think, oh, it's Spotify and Apple Music. Not in India, it's not. Uh, right. In India, it's Ghana and a bunch of other things. Uh, so so this this is a uh, this is a good report for Spotify. It, it's pretty wonky the whole thing about payroll taxes, but the the simplified version is they have to pay tax on the stock that they issue to their employees, and uh, some of their employees get bonus stocks. And the amount they pay is based on the value of the stock. And Spotify's stock been doing well, so it did better than they expected, and they had to pay more taxes. They say if you if you like normalize that to the tax they were paying last quarter, that they wouldn't have missed expectations on that. Uh, that's probably true, and it also shows that you know Spotify is definitely looking at podcasts as being a, an important part of its future. It's not going to stop being a music streaming service and certainly that that is its biggest way forward but getting people in the door for podcasts mm -hmm. it's spending a lot of money on it also didn't make as much money because they did a lot of aggressive free trials out there a lot of three-month free trials we'll see if that pays off as those people three months down the road and start turning into paid customers yeah on the podcast front oh sorry scott oh, go, no, ahead. go ahead go ahead uh, on the podcast front, it's funny because I I had sent the story over to to somebody I know who also likes some of the Ringer content, and he was like, "Ooh, what do they do? Pull it off of Apple Music?" And I'm like, "No, that's that's not that's not the point. That's not what Spotify is doing. They also own Gimlet Media, and I don't actually have a Spotify account. I can listen to all that stuff, but they are being aggressive with." 
super popular uh, podcasts, not necessarily a network itself that's popular, but they both of those networks have extremely popular podcasts on the network. And I, you know, I, I see this, it is a, there, there, there's something going on here and I'm not exactly sure what that's going to be. I don't think it would behoove Spotify to, to make podcasts exclusive because all it would do is bring down their numbers significantly. But I would like to see where this strategy is going, you know, in five years, what does it look like? Oh, yeah. I, I have a guess at that. I'm, my, my, my guess is that what Spotify's doing here is go, using these podcasts as a revenue generator, just selling ads straight into it, using that as an ability to sell ads to other podcasts that are on the Spotify platform, trying to make Spotify be the preeminent place where people go, well, I use Spotify for my podcast because it's so good and creating some exclusive podcasts that are sort of like bonus content. Not not the leader, not the one that everybody wants, but the one who's like, oh, they also have that. Oh, but I can only get that on Spotify. Uh, th those are the areas I see them moving into. Well, starting March 5th, Twitter, our old pals, uh, I shouldn't say that, not really anyone's pal. Anyway, <laughs> Uh, they may label faked images, video, and other media that have been significantly and deceptively altered or fabricated, that's a quote, uh, as manipulated media and link to Twitter moment sections that gives more context. If media or manipulated media is presented as truth and is, quote, likely to impact public safety or cause serious harm, unquote, it may be removed. Uh, when making a decision, Twitter will look at the accompanying text and account information. Users can appeal decisions, uh, which goes a long way to kind of my question about uh, fake positives and th or false positives, that sort of thing. But anyway, along with faked images and video, uh, Twitter will also consider modifying modifying subtitles or voiceover as manipulation as well. Yeah, so if, if the subtitles have been changed or if someone has manipulated the voiceover to make it sound like it's saying something different than it did before, uh, that counts under these rules. And, uh, I, I you know, this is a hard line to walk because you don't want memes to be outlawed right? That's, that's everybody's fear. Like, wait, so I can't, you know, fake a meme. No, that's not what Twitter's saying. They're like, if you're trying to deceive someone, we're going to label it and we're going to try to give people uh, a Twitter moments link. I'm not sure how useful that is, but a Twitter moments link uh, to figure out what's really going on. If we think it's significantly uh, going to impact public safety, or if it's going to cause serious harm, then we reserve the right to remove it. Uh, this is all in Twitter's judgment, though, and that's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that all pans out, just because false positives are a thing, and they aren't going to do these manually. So I have a lot of questions about how good it's going to be, but we'll see how it goes. ZDNet's Mary Jo Foley reports Microsoft announced internally a reorganization in its Experiences and Devices unit. Uh, one of the experiences is Windows, and the devices are Surface. And, well, they're going to merge those two together. The Windows Experience client team will combine with the hardware team under hardware chief Panos Panay starting February 25th. Windows Experience head Joe Belfiora will continue to lead the Essential Products Inclusive Community, or EPIC, team. That's the one that includes mobile apps. But starting this autumn, after a sabbatical, Belfiore will co-lead the Office Experience Group with Alex Holacek. Uh, so Alice will do the engineering, I think, and or, or vice versa, uh, and Joe Belfiore will do the product uh, as co-leads of Office Experience. This does not move the core OS of Windows at all. The actual kernel, the underpinnings, the how it works, the core OS is under the Azure engineering organization. However, the move does further formalize Microsoft's process of aiming to design Surface, the Windows experience, and Office so that they all work well together. That that while Windows is usable on multiple devices, uh, that it works really well on the hardware that Microsoft makes. So that's good for you as a user, right? Because if you buy a Surface, then then everything seems to make sense. It may not be great for third-party manufacturers. Microsoft's line up till now has been, we're just making hardware to show how you can move into new categories. But the hardware sales of Surface have been good enough that people are wondering if Microsoft might go, well, but even after that category is established, we might want to continue to make some money off of it. Mm. I mean, my... You and I talked about this pre-show, so I feel I've thought about it more, and I now feel confident in saying this. It feels like, as a regular Windows user and as a regular Mac OS user, that OSs in general, but but in particular Windows, 
feels more like these days that there are about nine or ten teams contributing to it. And by that, I mean it just feels a little patchworky. Um, everything from sudden updates that you didn't know were coming that happened, whether you want them to or not, that's a whole diff. That's more of a process thing. But the actual UX, the actual usability of Windows, how it functions, the fact that the the control panel is like three different control panels now. with They're yeah. just different skins on the same control panel. Like a lot of leftover stuff, new stuff covering up the old stuff. Never know what stuff you're going to be forced to look at, and updates sometimes change that. Just more than ever, I feel like Windows is in this weird place, and I wish there was a cohesive design plan that would bring it more closely to what I've always, or I should say usually ex expect from macOS, but even that in the last few years has experienced some of these sorts of things. Um, I don't know, you know, that's sort of apropos of nothing here, uh, but it, but it is when you, when this came up on the notes, it reminded me of that and just got me to thinking about how, how much more I think windows could, I don't know, be great right now. It's okay. And it gets the job done and it's dominant. So they don't have to do anything really to, to really truly push that dominance, but it doesn't feel like anybody in particular or any one group has control over that design. And well, and it, 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 they, they did. It was Joe Belfiore. And now it won't be. It'll be Panos Panay's team. Uh, right. there, there, there was, a, there, the, in fact, the whole point of this story is that there's a Windows experience team devoted to fixing all of these things. And think back to Windows 8. Wasn't yeah. it worse? I mean, it was, but at it, least it was and, like... And, and what has happened is as they try to pick up the pieces from Windows 8, you still see those pieces there. But I think personally it's been getting better because they've been trying to integrate Office Surface Windows experiences all into one. And we just haven't got to the end of that cleanup process yet. Yeah, I think that's probably that's probably fair. I mean, if the problem with 8 wasn't so much that but the one thing I liked about it is it did seem like, okay, brand new vision. Here's the focus. Boom, here it is. Not everybody liked it. It had its problems. There's no question about all of that. But now it just feels, seven felt more focused than this. Ten just feels yeah. slapdash and all this other stuff. I could go on for days, but I won't. I it, think you're reacting to problems in Windows 8 that have made it harder for Windows 10 to be as focused. It, you also may be reacting a little bit to the fact that, that Microsoft is no longer doing these five-year plans, uh, but doing constant updates. Mm -hmm. uh, so Windows 10 has been Windows 10 for years now and will continue to be, which which means you don't get that fresh new, like, okay, I'm going from XP to seven because I skipped Vista. Uh, you don't get that anymore. You're <laughs> just on Windows 10 from here on out. I thank you for skipping this. Then. <laughs> Russian security researcher Vladislav Yamak published details of a vulnerability in firmware for chips from Huawei owned High Silicon. High Silicon is a fully owned subsidiary of Huawei. The chips are often used by other manufacturers in security cameras, network video recorders, DVRs. Yamak said the exploit combines four security bugs that have previously been reported, March 2013, March 2017, July 2017, and September 2017. These are known vulnerabilities, and High Silicon just hasn't patched them. The vulnerability would let an attacker access Telnet and log in and gain root access. Yamak did not report the vulnerability to High Silicon, claiming he doesn't trust the company to fix the issues, <laughs> since they have left these previously known vulnerabilities unpatched, so he thought it was safer to just tell the public rather than wait around uh, to see if they were going to patch them. Yamak has made proof of concept code available on GitHub for users to test whether the devices are vulnerable. And you can either stop using the devices if you find one that has high silicon in it, or he says if you just can't afford to replace it, uh, re he recommends restricting network access to these devices so only trusted users can access them, especially on ports 23 TCP, 9530 TCP, and 9527, uh, because those ports can be exploited in attacks. This is not Huawei's networking gear. I want to make that very clear. It, it, this You can't just jump and say, see, this wholly owned subsidiary is doing something bad, and therefore I can't trust this other thing that's unrelated to it. But it is a, a good example of what Huawei has come into criticism for uh, itself, which is just not doing a good job patching stuff. This this is not a good way to be a spy, to leave like known vulnerabilities, because everybody knows they're there. Uh, they're, this is not a good backdoor if you really want to spy on somebody. It's just incompetence. How many it's, people? Oh, go ahead. It's also if, if the last uh, exploit that that Yamak um, was able to 
to to pinpoint was in 2017 and says, I don't trust the company to fix this. Why are we hearing about it now? Because he's saying uh, these exploits were out. Everybody let people know about them. Uh -huh. And then he's like, I went back to check and see. Like, did I they see. patch them? No, they didn't. In fact, four vulnerabilities can be used together to do this even cooler thing if you're a hacker uh, or even more dangerous thing if you're somebody who has the device. How many do, do you give any indication of how many devices this is? I mean, we're talking about like a high silicon's in a ton of devices. So uh, you probably just want to, if you're really concerned, uh, you either want to check your products to see if you can figure out what chips in them or use this GitHub tool to just run it on your network and, and see if it detects any of this stuff. There you go. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. One of the stalwart pieces of film history is. L'arrivée d'un train en guerre de la ciotat. A 50 That's second. Very good, Tom. Oh, very thank good. you, Sarah. Very good. A 50 second silent movie of a train pulling into a station. It's it's famous. You've you've probably seen it. It's the one that is often shown along with apocryphal scenes of people ducking as they mistake the train for real. Nobody knows if that really happened, but that's the story: is that no one had seen a movie before, and so everybody like flinched uh, when a train kept started rolling down the screen. The historic film was made by the Lumiere brothers in 1896 using a cinematograph camera on 35 millimeter film. Now, that's not very high res, right? It's 35 mil, but it's old. Denis Shuryaev has used the Dane, D-A-I-N, and Topaz Labs Gigapixel AI enhancement programs, two different programs, to transform the film into a 4K 60 frame per second clip. Dane, yeah, very cool. Man. I know, right? Uh, Dane creates extra frames to smooth out the motion. Uh, this is a case where motion smoothing is good, uh, not left on by mistake after you buy a TV. Uh, so it, it fills in the frames in a way that that smooths things out. It's very jerky in the original 35 millimeter. And then Gigapixel AI's algorithm is trained to recognize details and complete an image using bilinear and bicubic interpolation. So a little bit of sharpening. Uh, a little bit of of accuracy. Uh, for instance, bilinear interpolation will fill in pixels. So you you have if you're if you're taking a low res image and you're making it 4K, you're going to have a lot of space where there aren't pixels. That's why it looks kind of blurry if you just blow it up. So what this bilinear interpolation does is fills in the pixels by creating a gradient between the two nearest pixels. So that makes it sharper because you don't have gaps, but it's less color accurate. Uh, by cubic samples from the 16 nearest pixels to the gap, which improves the color, but that can actually make it blurry still. So using both is what Gigapixel AI does, and that helps correct for each other and cause the sharpness. Uh, this is this is cool looking. Uh, it's it's super sharp compared to the original, and. Uh, after they posted this on YouTube, they added a link to the Deoldify YouTube channel. Uh, Deoldify is a neural network that was used to make a 1080p colorized version of this. So you could actually see kind of a natural color version of train arriving in the station. This is so cool. And it makes me think there's enough granularity in the process that the application is far and wide. It's like, do we need to take some old thing? Let's say the Hindenburg going down and we need it to not only restore it, but let's make multiple versions of it. Let's see it in color. Let's see it in 60 frame 4K. Let's see it with some, you know, uh, with frame, you know, this frame smoothing or adding frames, adding pixels where they're now missing or whatever. And just not to say, hey, now this is the new official thing. We, we love having the archive, but just to be able to look at it in a different way, see it in a new light. That's fascinating to me. This isn't just like the colorization fad of the 1990s uh with ted turner this feels like something right. else and i really like it i think it's awesome somebody you know, in the chat room asked what the uh what the resolution of the original 35 millimeter is i don't know exactly for this one but most 35 millimeter film is about 87 megapixels or, or 320 by 320 sorry looking, yeah. looking at you know no looking at the um the original video versus the 4k versus the colorized they're all I mean, they all feel very rich to me. And maybe it's because, yes, I have seen this original video, I don't know, over the years and whatever capacity I've seen it in. But uh, 
but it's it's sort of like it doesn't necessarily make it better, but it does create a richness and another layer that yeah, yeah. just wasn't there before. And that's what's so cool to me. It, it seems feels, like these people look real instead of looking like yeah, that's it. I that's mean, it exactly. It feels yeah. modern, even though they're all dressed in old timey eighteen ninety six clothing. Uh you they look like real people rather than that a period appropriate versions of people. Yeah, in a are, in know. a way it like demythologically Eyed them, <laughs> takes them De out of myth like, mythologizes. Yeah, yeah however that like word that. should go, gives them, <laughs> takes away the myth of the 1800s, and the herky jerky and the and the, all the limitations, which are in their own way awesome, right? We no no way to diminish those, but those people suddenly look like I don't know people I'd see at the mall, or the way they move is natural. Their faces are inquisitive, and they look at the camera. Yeah, the the, the movement is less herky jerky. You don't, you don't think don't, like, oh, I guess people in the 1890s all moved like this, <laughs> you know, because because you're seeing natural motions. The the ones that are hurrying for the train just. It's like, oh man, those those folks are booking. I, I think I attributed their speed to the the jerkiness of the frame rate in the past, and and that ain't true. Uh, they're 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 moved. They're just booking along like like normal people. And then when you add the color, that adds another layer of reality to it because suddenly, you know, and and these aren't perfect. There are some artifacts if you look close. They 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 look better on YouTube than they would on a large screen, to be honest. Uh, but it's certainly an achievement. It's certainly something that that has an effect. Yeah, it's very cool. It's surrealistic in some weird way, and I can't really put my finger on why, but it, it feels like maybe somebody filmed something yesterday in mm -hmm. black and white to try to fool me to look like something that was from the 1800s. That, yeah, That's for very sure. Very odd. Very odd. <laughs> well, you know who never fools us? The people on our subreddit. You can submit stories that you care about and you want us to care about as well and vote on others. Dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com is where to join in the fun also fun, our Discord, you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's. Chris Allen wrote in um, today, in fact, right before the show, and said, regarding the Iowa voting... Well, he didn't say anything about the kerfuffle, but I'll just go ahead and say kerfuffle. It says, writing software can be difficult at the best of times, but writing a time-sensitive, highly concurrent, mission-critical piece of software that is used every four years sounds like a nightmare. Given these demands, I was shocked to hear that the Iowa Reporter app wasn't being run at the same time as traditional caucus counting methods. When you have to prove trustworthiness, running both systems in parallel seems like the only way to go. Simulations aren't enough, at least in my opinion. So true, so true. I, I, I would say that the traditional methods of counting were being run in parallel. Uh, that is why we didn't have any actual problems with the vote. They, they had paper trail on everything and the vote count is just slow. But I think what Chris was getting to is not just that the, the counting method was run in parallel as a backup, but that they should have just been telling people like, use the app, but also call in a phone. Like, let's actually run the whole system as if the app isn't there, but use the app to test it out and make sure it works. And then you probably would have had a faster count going on. And that's that's just good test methodology. Like like Chris says, rather than relying on simulations, we we don't know if they did simulations or not, but even if they did, it, it wouldn't have uh, simulated the amount of load that they experienced and, and the bugs that they ran into. It's also important, or at least in my head, to just look at it from the angle of society has has continually tried to move toward a more paperless society a more automated sort of approach to almost everything we do and we constantly step back and go oh that didn't work out very well we got to stick with this or we got to keep fax machines forever or we got to do whatever and i think this is just another example of that it's just so easy to get all worked up about it given its political nature and i understand that but at the same time yeah, they'll probably keep having the backup old ways will probably always be there no matter where this advances to or at least well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, with your paperless office thing, I thought that way five, 10 years ago, like, I guess we're not getting a paperless office, but now I've rarely print anything like it happened. It just had, didn't happen when we thought it was going to happen because yeah, we had to good get point. good at it first. Right. Like right. the first time you have software, it's going to break. It's going to be buggy. That's what people have to realize. Totally agree. Hey, shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Brad Schick, Paul Boyer, and Dustin Campbell. 
also thanks to Scott Johnson, a wonderful <laughs> hero of all of ours. Uh, Scott, what's been going on in your world? Well, I'm very excited to announce uh, this week that I launched a brand new comic strip. And people are thinking, whoa, you haven't done that for 15 years. And the answer is, that's true. I haven't. Um, but I've done it. And it's, uh, it's a weird one. It's called Fred and Can. It's literally about a guy named Fred and a sentient can of expired cream corn. Uh, if you don't believe me, you got to go check it out. Um, I put up two of the strips. It is a weekly strip for now. It may go more if my personal Patreon kicks in uh, to go to a different level. But right now, it's a strip a week. You can find the first two editions at fredcancomic.com. Or if you just go to frogpants.com, it takes you to a splash page that tells you about that uh, and lets you jump straight to it. Uh, there's RSS feed. You can get it on Instagram. You can get it on Facebook, Twitter, whatever. It's pretty much everywhere you want to be. And I'm very excited about it. Uh, again, that's fredcancomic.com. Let me know what you think. Send your feedback. I would appreciate it. Oh, and you can find me on Twitter and yell at me about my dumb comic ideas at Scott Johnson. I'm adding this to my Feedly immediately. Uh, <laughs> folks, we have a new Patreon reward merchandise plan in place right now. We're in the second month of it, but it's not too late. Anybody who signs up after they've been a patron for three months can get a sticker, a poster, a shirt, or a mug with our special DTNS six-year anniversary logo on it. Uh, get the details at patreon.com slash DTNS slash merch. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Keep that feedback coming. We'd love to know how you're feeling. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>